Welcome, everyone. Great to see you here. Thanks for joining us. I'm Greg Dalton. In 2007, I went to the Arctic on a global warming expedition with scientists and journalists aboard an icebreaker. Experiencing climate change at the top of the world changed my life. And when I returned, I created Climate One as a project of the Commonwealth Club. For the last 12 years, I've been interviewing leaders about how burning fossil fuels changes all of the systems around us. Our food system, our water system, our ecosystems, our lifestyles, and our economy. Climate changes everything. Today, we're discussing the way our society makes and distributes the power that runs our modern lives. We'll hear about characters trying to remake the power system and what lies ahead for wind energy generated on land and offshore, solar, battery-powered cars, and more. Pleased to welcome three guests who've been on Climate One before, joining us for the first time in our shiny new modern home. Russell Gold is a reporter with the Wall Street Journal based in Austin, Texas, and author of the new book, Superpower, One Man's Quest to Transform American Energy. Jigger Shaw, co-founder of Generate Capital and co-host of the Energy Gang podcast, and Lynn Duan, team leader for power and gas at Bloomberg News. Please welcome them to Climate One. Thank you, Greg. Welcome to you all. Uh, Russell Gold, tell us, set us for us uh, the stage here, the American power grid, something that a lot of people don't think about. They just want to flip that switch and have it work. But uh, set the stage for us about how it evolved and, and, and why, what it was built for. Well, when we started building the power grid, I mean, this is going back over 100 years, uh, we would build these very small grids. You know, you'd have a... a, a, a a coal burning power plant and maybe it would feed uh, within a mile or two. Um, but there was a big problem with that. We would use coal in these things that we call them dynamos um, and they'd be in a basement and basically your downtown would just be filled with smoke. So then someone said, well, we know, let's start moving the generating stations further away, building transmission, building larger networks. And so we started doing that. And then Right about 1920, 1910, we started connecting these different regional grids uh, because it was efficient. You know, we could, we could uh, build bigger plants and we could drive down prices and we had hydro in certain places we could share. So we started building slowly the beginnings of a national grid. The problem is we stopped. We didn't complete this journey. And so what we're left with in this country are not one national grid or a continental grid. We have three grids, but even within that, we have sort of this weird balkanized system where we have different grids in each state or in each region. And the idea of generating, let's say, you know, for the sake of my book, wind in the Great Plains and moving that power towards California, moving it towards the East Coast, it's just inconceivable. We've built up too many barriers and we just, we don't have a grid that sort of thinks that way. And we did that with highways, uh, as you note in your book. Uh, so tell us about Michael Skelly, the character you focus on, an entrepreneur, energy executive who tried to, to build an electrical highway. Uh, so set that up for us and then we'll hear a little bit from him. Sure. So when I uh, set about to write this book, what I wanted to do is write a little bit about um, scale. You know, I wanted to write who's out there tackling, trying to build renewables, trying to really make a difference. And I encountered, uh, I, I, a couple people told me I needed to meet this guy in Houston named Michael Skelly. So I went to meet him and it turned out uh, he'd been building wind since about 2000 and he had this big idea. And the big idea was let's build in the middle of the country in the Oklahoma panhandle in, in Kansas, let's build these giant wind and, and potentially solar farms. And then let's build essentially long extension cords, transmission lines, DC transmission lines to the east and to the west to bring that inexpensive power. Um, and so he set off right about 2009, he set off to do that. And that's the story of your book. But after a, about a decade of work on the project, Skelly's dream collapsed. Here he is telling him just a bit of his story. I got involved in wind in the late 90s, originally in, in Latin America, and then quickly thereafter in the United States. We built a very successful company that built lots of projects around the country. You don't have to spend that much time in wind energy to realize that one of the biggest constraints to the future deployment of more wind is the lack of infrastructure. And we thought that we'd be in a good position to attract long-term capital to go about the, what we knew would be a really long and difficult 
voyage trying to do interstate transmission lines. The wind is concentrated in the United States in the middle of the country, and the trick is to get it out of the middle of the country to major load centers, and we were focusing on the Chicago, Illinois area, Indiana, and this is the subject of the book, uh, focused on a big project from the panhandle of Oklahoma to Memphis where we could get power to TVA and to states throughout the southeast. Trying to work with TVA was really quite frustrating because we feel like we proved out with numbers that we would save TVA ratepayers a lot of money and we could never get them around to that view. And I think their view was colored by other considerations other than cost. Renewables have become a bit more of a partisan issue, and that's not really good for anybody, particularly when the economics are now so clearly positive for renewable energy. I got involved in wind energy in the late 90s because I thought it was just a very cool and interesting thing to generate power using the wind. And 20 years later, I am super bullish on the prospects for wind energy. I continue to be concerned that we're not building the right infrastructure to go with these new forms of energy. So that's my note of caution. That's Michael Skelly, the founder and chairman of Clean Line Energy Partners. Russell Gold, a couple things that I want to pick up. One is price. Price doesn't win. We're taught that in markets, low cost wins. <laughs> and in this case, low cost didn't win. Right. Well, I mean, one of the remarkable things about renewable energy these days is that on a pure generation perspective, it is now the low cost source of electricity. Um, five years ago, couldn't say that at all. Now it's true. And, you know, with Skelly, when he was, and everyone calls him Skelly, so if it was, excuse me if I just kind of go with what everyone says, you know, Skelly and his team at CleanLine, they were offering TVA uh, a 20-year contract at this incredibly low price of $18.50 per megawatt hour. So you don't need to know all the details of the economics. That is a remarkably low price. And yet TVA wasn't taking it. And the lesson here, and we sort of, I get into this in the book, um, was that sometimes markets don't win out. Sometimes politics wins out. And he says that uh, renewables are increasingly partisan. You ran into uh, talk about yeah. Lamar Alexander doesn't like anything related to wind. Uh, he's not the only one. So tell us about the partisan resistance to this, what should be you know, a, a good thing for Republicans, low price. Look, you know, I've said this for, for a long time. If you give me a person and, and let me ask them like five questions about energy, you know, what's your opinion about this? What's your opinion about coal and nuclear? I will be able to tell you whether they're Republican or Democrat, um, you know, 99% of the time. And that's kind of ridiculous because um, why, why have we turned, I guess we've turned everything in this country into a partisan fight. We certainly have turned energy. And, you know, who loses in that case? Well, who loses often are going to be ratepayers, are going to be people who use electricity, which is pretty much everyone, um, who at this point are not going to get the benefits of the low-cost renewable energy, which, you know, we're talking about dollars and cents here, but also happens to have the benefit uh, of not producing carbon and not contributing to climate change. So what's the upshot? You wrote this book about this guy who has this grand vision to, to bring uh, affordable, clean energy, and the, the kind of the empire eats him up. You know, he doesn't win. Well, yes and no. So, so I focused on one particular line he was trying to build from Oklahoma to, to Memphis, but he had about three or four lines he was working on. One of them looks like it actually is going to get built. This is, he had to sell it off to a Chicago company called Invenergy. That looks like it's going to be built. So we still have the possibility of one of these lines getting built and showing what, you know, the, how much it, it could be, how much savings can be generated, how much money uh, you can make as an investor. And that's important because if we're going to have an energy transition, there's got to be private capital. Investors have to feel like they're going to get a good return. And, uh, and that's one of the things he was really trying to show. We'll get into that private capital later. Jigger Shaw, um, you've been involved in solar, one of the other uh, big renewables for a long time. For many Americans who were around then, uh, solar, they think of panels on the White House, right? You know, <laughs> Jimmy Carter putting panels on the White House. So tell us the, you know, the history of renewables and solar since Jimmy Carter did that. We know Ronald Reagan took him down, but summarize the arc of the story the last couple of decades. Well, and those solar panels were solar hot water panels. Right. Uh, they weren't even solar photovoltaic panels. Um, yeah, I started my journey in 95 for Astropower. And um, 
the solar panels that we sold there were for telecom towers and ranchers, right? The telecom towers were, you know, they were helicoptering diesel to these telecom towers. And so solar was way cheaper than helicoptering diesel uh, <laughs> to telecom towers, right? So that was our, our big market in 95. And then, you know, you had uh, ranchers who wanted to electrify fences and five watt panels along their fence were a lot cheaper than connecting to the grid on their fence, right? And so, you know, fast forward to 2003, I started Sun Edison um, and we won the largest contract uh, ever in uh, 2004, which was the California Power Authority, gave us a 4.3 megawatt contract on 13 buildings across California, right? Chuckawalla State Prison and the California State University locations, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we closed a big financing with Goldman Sachs. That was the first institutional capital that was raised for solar. Um, and that model that we created has now attracted close to about a trillion dollars of capital. So, like, so we've come a long ways today. And, you know, I would say today, the thing that people, I think, have a hard time wrapping their brain around is how much money has been made in this sector, right? None of that trillion dollars lost money. All of it has made tons of money, but right? But Sun Edison went bankrupt. Well, but that's, that's well... I, I sold the company in 2009 and made a lot of money on that sale. Um, and the person who bought that company from me, yes, like put it's it into timing. the ground. But I think that, but I think that... The, so there's winners and losers here, okay. Well, but the trillion dollars is what matters, right? The 50 million here and the 100 million there that's put into companies is what everyone loves to lionize and talk about how wonderful these people are. But the trillion is all pension money, sovereign wealth fund money that's going into ownership of these solar plants, ownership of these wind farms. And that money is actually making really good 7, 8, 9, 10% returns on investment, which is helping to pay pensioners... Um, you know, over 20 to 30 years. And a lot of insurance company money is in there, et cetera, right? So I think that it's important to note just the sheer size of the capital because people talk a lot about $200 billion going into fracking or all these other things. But the numbers that we're putting up rival those numbers and actually beat them on a regular basis. And this is real institutional sort of core, big smart money, so to big speak. Big infrastructure, big Australian superannuation funds, Swiss funds, Canadian pension funds. But Lin Duan, the clean energy sector has a dirty secret. Mm. What is the dirty secret of clean energy? The dirty secret is that renewable energy actually looks a whole lot like the rest of the energy industry, white, male, and aging. So um, last year, it's funny because we wrote this great feature about the fact that renewable energy was helping the power sector really break the mold. They were hiring these women for really important leadership roles. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that it's an industry of change, right? So utilities are in a very transformative period, and that's opening up this opportunity for women to rise through the ranks in a way that they hadn't been able to before. Well, then this Brookings Institute report comes out earlier this year, and it shows that renewable energy generation is actually just like coal and natural gas and oil. And in some ways, it's actually less diverse than those fossil fuels industries. And we set out to find out why. So we wrote a big story earlier this year about the fact that renewable energy is essentially an engineering and construction industry. I mean, if you think about it, it's just building these massive solar and wind projects. And we all know that the engineering and construction industry has basically been a male-dominated field for many, many years. But that's not where the story ends, because the reason why we actually wrote this story is because we were then hearing from women at these solar and wind projects that were saying, where the heck are all the other women here? And what they know that a lot of other people might not know is that the renewable energy industry is creating more jobs than any other industry in the United States. The solar technician and wind technici technician jobs those are the two fastest growing professions in the U.S. today. So if women and minorities are missing out on this renewable energy industry opportunity, then they're being left out of the biggest job boom that America has to offer today. And that's why people are calling for change. I mean, Ten years ago, Van Jones was out there with green collar jobs. Remember, you know, this, is, this was supposed to be part of the, part of the promise of green energy is, is of, you know, uh, labor jobs that could not be exported to China, installation jobs. So why hasn't Correct. that happened? 
I think that, you know, from the, the interviews that we did as part of this story, what came, what, 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 what the industry is coming to realize is that they have fallen into what some were calling a startup phenomenon. You know, you, you have this industry and it's nascent and all they're focused on is growth and getting their product to market and making it happen. And they, they couldn't afford both financially and just resource wise the attention to be focused on things like how do we get more women into our workforce? How do we get more minorities? And as Jigger can, can, can testify to, it's a, it's a realization that the industry is now coming upon now that it has established itself as a major part of the U.S. economy and is now saying, okay, this is a problem. Let's clean it up now. Jigger, what are the structural factors that kind of favor um, wealthy white men to lead you know, in, in clean energy? You say there's some really some structural reasons. Well, as a wealthy white man, um, <laughs> <laughs> I can answer that question. I... Um, Look, I, you know, I think in the early days when I joined the industry, um, it was, if you were a developer, right, you basically worked for free, right? That's how you became a developer. You, uh, you know, paid with sweat equity to get into the business. You may have gotten a few dollars from this person and that person to pay for a couple of interconnection studies or whatnot, but ultimately you work for free. And obviously people who work for free are Work for free folks, hoping for a big payout down yeah, the road. Yeah, for equity, yeah. sorry. Like yeah. those people are generally folks who can afford to do that, right? So they come from uh, some sort of capital source that allows them to be able to do that, right? So, and then the same thing was true with solar installers. I mean, for solar installers, you really needed a $200,000 credit line to be a solar installer, right? And so that credit line had to come from somewhere, and the vast majority of those credit lines came from people's home equity in their homes, right? So if you didn't that's what you have did. that home equity, I did the same thing to start Sun Edison. So if you didn't have that home equity because you were redlined in the 1950s or whatever it is that caused you not to have that, then you can imagine that no matter how much passion you had for that industry, it was really hard for you to set up that business. And so I do think that is that is how we came about and how we started. But, you know, I think today there is a tremendous amount of focus on solving that problem, and whether it's grid alternatives here in, in, you know, California, which has branches across the country, or whether it's many other organizations. I do think the renewable energy is taking, industry is taking seriously its responsibility to help change that trajectory. If you're just joining us, we're talking about renewable power and the energy grid in America with Russell Gold, reporter with the Wall Street Journal and author of the new book, Superpower, One Man's Quest to Transform American Energy, and Jigger Shaw, energy investor and podcast host, and Lynn Duan, energy editor with Bloomberg News. I'm Greg Dalton. Uh, Russell Gold, one of the ideas uh, that I had coming out of your, your book is, can America do really big things anymore? <laughs> you know, can we do the, the, the interstate highway system? You know, we've heard a lot about the moonshot this summer. Can America go big anymore? What, what do you think after tackling this? Well, I think we, we better. Um, you know, if, if we have, if we can't, I think as a country, we're going to be in, in big trouble. But one of the lessons from my book was just how difficult this became. I mean, when Skelly and the Clean Line Group were trying to build this transmission line, they were going into places like Arkansas, to try to, to get not just political permission, but permission from the landowners, and was encountering this resistance. And one of the fascinating things I wanted to know is where is this resistance coming from? You know, they were offering uh, payments, you know, this is much like uh, leasing for oil and gas. Uh, and and the, pay, the, the, the opposition, a lot of the opposition was coming from people who were sort of saying, you know what, I haven't benefited from the last 10 years of the economic boom. The economic boom post Great Recession has helped the coasts um, and has helped you, private, you know, private company out of Houston. I didn't feel anything. And now you wanna come in and you wanna take my land to build a transmission line. So the point I think I'm trying to make is that one of the barriers that prevents us from thinking big is a division right now in this country between people who feel like they're being left behind and people who are benefiting from this, you know, this incredibly long uh, economic expansion we're going through. And that's a problem. Until we solve that, it's going to be really hard to think about big energy projects. And Jigger Shaw, the, the Green New Deal, one of the things it brought together was saying, but we, we need to address climate change, but there's some fundamentals of capitalism and wealth and power distribution that need to be solved at the same time. Mm. Your thought on that? Well, it certainly pulls well. Um, so, <laughs> so, so that's good. Um, 
Look, I, I do think that we have to acknowledge what it is that we all enjoy, right? Whether it's being able to, you know, jump into a car and drive, you know, four hours to the nearest, like, tourist attraction for vacation with your family, or whether it's figuring out how to um, get electricity, water, sewer, natural gas connections to your home, right? Even, even today, right, you know, almost... 40% of Americans are not connected to natural gas, right? So as much as everyone's like, natural gas for all, we've fracked the, you know, that we've, we've got the solution to fracking and we've basically got cheap gas for everybody. There's a lot of people on propane. There's a lot of people on electricity. There's a lot of people on fuel oil, right? And so I think one of the challenges that I see is that we, we just tend not to finish our work, right? In the 1980s, we had built all of these nuclear plants in the 70s. And so we were actually full of electricity. We had so much electricity, we had no place to put it. Too cheap right? to meter. Yeah. Right. And so we built pumped hydro, not because we thought we needed storage on the grid, but because we had no place to put the nuclear power because it had to run 24-7, right? We also converted all of the water heaters in, in Washington State or in like Florida to electric. Think about how that happened, right? The utility company woke up one morning and said, we are rate basing all of this, right? <laughs> you get a water heater and you get a water heater and you get a water heater, right? And everyone got a water heater and they sold more electricity. Today, right, if you're in Vermont or New Hampshire or New York or these other places and you have people on fuel oil, they have health impacts that are higher because they burn fuel oil, like the utility company feels powerless to go to them and say, we are going to give you an air source heat pump. We are going to give you a ground source heat pump and we're going to rate base it, right? Instead, they say, here's a $2,000 subsidy. And then if you can fill out this paperwork and you can figure out this third party ownership structure, then maybe we'll convert you, right? I think part of the Green New Deal, I hope, and right now it's a resolution so you can see whatever you want to see in it, right? But Part of it, I think, I hope, is to suggest that the government does have a role in saying this stuff has been fully tested, right? We already know how to do this, right? When you think about the polar vortex, there are people in my hometown in Sterling, Illinois, that couldn't get their homes above 55 degrees because it was just so leaky and they just couldn't do it, right? Right. We know how to weatherize homes. In fact, we increased weatherization dollars 10x during the stimulus bill, right, the American Reinvestment Act. So we just have, didn't finish the job, right? And so I hope that the Green New Deal means that, you know, there's a way to finish what we started. In California, it wants to move away from natural gas. And so the idea that everyone's not connected to gas, California is trying to, you know, make it so that some people are never connected to natural gas and electrify everything. But Russell Gold, you want to jump yeah. You were saying before, and I thought it was interesting, that we built pump storage because we had too much generation. We're entering a phase in this country where we have too much generation Absolutely. of certain things. Um, in Texas, there was too much wind that was being built. So what did they? What did Texas do? Did something very un-Texas, and I can say this as a Texan. They socialized the cost of building transmission. So we got right. all these great new uh, transmission lines, um, and now I mean, Texas has 20%. Um, first six months of the year, 20% of the Texas grid ran off wind. Um, More than they used coal. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that might be happening here in the United States is that because we have so much inexpensive, um, we have the potential for so much inexpensive wind and solar, as that gets built out, there's going to be an increased pressure to say, what do we do, all, what do, we do with all of this? And one of the answers is going to be, hey, let's build some wires. Let's build some wires to get this to different people. Um, and, you know, and that's going to be a potential, you know, that's where there's going to be jobs there. There's going to be, you know, it's, this is sort of what we do in the United States. This is something Skelly has said a lot. We overbuild, and then we realize we've got a problem, and then we go to solve it. So maybe that's how we, getting back to your question before, maybe that's how we do big things. We sort of back ourselves into a corner, and then we say, oh, you know, what are we going to do? We built all these, you know, these wind farms in the, in the middle of the country. What are we going to do with them? Um, you know, here in California, we're putting up all the solar, and then there are certain times of the day where, Power, we don't even know what to do with all the power. We're generating too much of it. So maybe the answer is we start doing big things when we back ourselves in the corner and then we got to figure out a solution.
Linduan, uh, there's some interesting innovation happening where the combination of batteries and renewables replacing gas-fired power plants. There's one in Glendale, Southern California, near Los Angeles, where batteries and distributed solar and geothermal are replacing gas-fired plant here in the Bay Area. Oakland, California, a power plant that runs on jet fuel, super duty, dirty, yeah. is being replaced by sun-run solar and batteries. So talk about these virtual power plants and how storage is kind of to, really starting to knock out some of the dirty fuel. Yeah, you know, Jigger and Russell are going to kill me because they just talked about how powerful politics play into this and the renewable energy boom. What I would say is renewable energy is happening despite politics as well, right? I mean, you have like an, you, you have an unprecedented tax on solar imports and solar is still getting installed, both on the rooftop level and in a big way. And it's the same thing with solar and batteries. What you're talking about are these virtual power plants and really what they are, are just these clusters of batteries and solar and wind. I mean, they're like clusters of wind, solar, and battery all together being proposed as these massive power, plant, power plants across the United States. And it's not like they're being propped up by policy. There are some that are just competing in regular, uh, I can't say RFP because you won't allow me, requests for proposals uh, from utilities that are saying, we just need power. Who's, who's going to bid for this power? And they're beating out natural gas. They're beating out coal. They're beating out other very traditional forms of power. So I'd argue that there is a place for renewable energy and for development of that regardless of policy. But, um, but, but that is what you're seeing in these places where traditional power plants are being phased out. And instead of being replaced with other power plants, they're being replaced with solar and wind and batteries. And you know, the one point that I wanted to make about virtual power plants is when you brought up that phrase, that's not actually the first um, definition that comes to mind when I think of a virtual power plant. The first time I heard that phrase, it didn't relate to replacing power generation with more power generation. It referred to power demand from people like you and me. So there were these tech companies that were going out there and saying, hey, if we can aggregate all of our power demand and we could like commit to reducing it by this much at this time and then sell that commitment as a commodity into the wholesale power markets, we we could make money, we could kill the need for more power plants in the future, and, uh, and I think that that's like a really interesting idea that we shouldn't lose sight of, because while energy efficiency and like energy demand are the sexiest of topics in our world, um, they actually have contributed to emissions reductions in a way that other energy resources haven't been able to do. I, you know, that's a, great, that's a great point, because there's a lot of creativity in this space right now. There's creativity on reducing demand. There's creativity in how we aggregate solar. Um, you know, and I, look, I, I wrote a book about transmission. I actually don't think transmission is the silver bullet. It is one of these different ideas. Uh, and frankly, given what's going on with the climate, we sort of need to be trying them all simultaneously. You know, we, we, we don't have the luxury to say, you know what, let's build transmission and see if that solves the problem. Mm -hmm. let's, let's build, um, you know, let's do a lot of distributed solar and see if that solves the problem. We sort of need to be doing it all at the same time um, be, for a couple different reasons. One, some parts of the country work better with solutions than others. Uh, we need to be moving quickly. And, you know, look, I'm not smart enough. Jigger, maybe you're smart enough, but I, I, I'm not smart enough to tell you I know what the answer is, how we're going to be powering the United States uh, or the world uh, 20 or 30 years from now. But I am certain that that idea is out there right now. And given the right amount of capital and the ability to go out, um, you know, something's going to catch fire. Now, I wrote uh, several years ago, I wrote a book about fracking. And, you know, now we talk about fracking, we understand just it's how it's, we're producing so much more oil and natural gas in this country. You know, 20 years ago, when the first modern well was fracked, the, the engineer, who I've talked to several times, he had no idea that this was going to be a big, such a big deal. Sometimes it takes that small idea, let's experiment, let's see if this works, and it sort of just catches fire and grows. Jigger, go ahead, go ahead. Well, just to put some numbers around it, I think, you know, in the state of California, but this is true nationwide, if you had a million um, high-capacity electric vehicles, right, vehicles that have over 200 miles of range, that alone basically in a vehicle-to-grid format could back up the whole California power grid. Right? If you had four million houses that had a Nest thermostat or Ecobee, could do the same thing, right? If you just, you know, California's mandating solar on all new homes starting next year. They build about 200,000 new homes 
per year. If you had 10 kilowatts per home, because they're no longer going to be connected to natural gas, right? And they're, power, they're mm -hmm. powering all of it. Then you're talking about 2,000 megawatts getting added every year, right? Just from that, which is massive, right? And so I just think that when, when Russell and Lynn talk about how this all come together, you really can see how you get to scale through five, six, seven ideas very quickly, like in less than 10 years. One of the things that I'm happening, I think a lot about power these days, the, the industry of Thomas Edison and the industry of, of uh, John D. Rockefeller are, are colliding and, and kind of getting in each other's lanes, right? So the uh, electricity companies are getting into transportation, transportation, uh, oil companies are getting to electricity. So Jigger, talk a little bit about the, the industries of Edison and Rockefeller colliding over this new, this new transition. So, so one of my first jobs uh, was working for BP. And, you know, I still... Uh, remember all the people I worked with. I mean, just the smartest people you'd ever, you know, work with in your career. Um, you know, it's an organization that had deep amount of training and all the technical know-how. I mean, going into places like Azerbaijan or Angola or Russia and like figuring out how to like make that work is, you know, extraordinary. So I learned a ton. Suitcases of cash, that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. There were, there were definitely uh, exchanges of monetary equivalents, I think, as we called it. But I think um, what's amazing today is they are more afraid of electric vehicles than they are of anything else. Mm. And the main reason for that is I remember um, in 2004, um, I think it was 2004, we had a Honda Civic Hybrid. And I don't know if you remember, but Washington, D.C. had that sniper that was killing mm -hmm. people while they were mm -hmm. filling up their gas tank. My wife was so ecstatic that we had 700 miles of range yeah. that we never had to <laughs> fill up our gas tank that entire time. And when you talk to people, they don't want to go to gas stations to fill up their tank. This is not like an enjoyable experience. It's a necessary <laughs> evil for what they need for mobility. And I think, you know, people are starting to realize now that with these 200 plus mile range electric vehicles, you really can go across the country. I mean, one of my high school friends um, who you wouldn't have thought, you know, was going to do this, got one of the first Model Xs, right? It was a $100,000 vehicle. He wasn't making that much money. He was a senior engineer on the OnStar program. And, you know, he came out to visit me and drove from Chicago to D.C. in his Model X. And he said it was a very pleasant experience. He, like, had one Tesla supercharge. His kids loved the half an hour break, and it was easy to do. And so they are really reeling um, because what, what you find is the automobile sector, even though they've been joined at the hip with the oil companies, they don't want to be, right? They really are consumer companies, right? They actually want to be responsive to their consumers, and they're realizing, wait a second, why are we so tied to oil? We don't have to be. We can be just as innovative and just as successful on the electric vehicle side, and they're starting to break those ties, and the oil companies are beside themselves trying to figure out what to do next. Yeah, and autonomy is really driving that electrification. Uh, we're going to go to our lightning round and ask our guests a series of true or false questions. Uh, uh, beginning with Russell Gold, true or false, everyone thought the wind industry would sputter when George W. Bush became president. Oh, I think so. True. Uh, the opposite happened. Yeah. Uh, Lynn Duan, uh, Bloomberg reporters are happy Michael Bloomberg didn't run for president. Uh, True. Be because... <laughs> <laughs> you, don't even know, you don't even need to know why. We're just ding, 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 because ding. that yeah. might have prompted him to sell the company. Okay. We love being owned by him. Uh, Jigger Shaw, true or false, Tesla will be an independent company in 10 years. False. Yeah. Uh, true or false, Russell Gold, the TVA, Texas, uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, purchased a pair of $10 million corporate jets and a $7 million luxury helicopter to ferry around its executives and board members. True. Lin Duan, uh, true or false, Bloomberg's offices in San Francisco Bay, just a block from here, will be flooded by rising seas in your lifetime. False? <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope it's false. We have a lot of climate wealth to create. Right? There we go. Okay. Um, true or false, Jigger Shaw, Green Tech Media studiously dissected the Climate One podcast before and studied the Climate One podcast before beginning the Energy Gang podcast. I will say that's true. 
Learn from the best. Uh, <laughs> uh, Russell Gold, uh, true or false, PG&E will be broken up. Oof. <laughs> true. True. Uh, Jigger Shaw, PG&E has gotten off easy so far for its role in California's deadly wildfires. True. Uh, last one, Lynn Duan, true or false, jobs that women hold in renewable energy companies are often as glorified secretaries. True. Let's give them a round for getting through the lightning round. <laughs> We're talking at Climate One about the uh, renewable energy and the grid with Russell Gold, reporter for the Wall Street Journal, Jigger Shaw, energy investor and podcast host, and Lynn Duan in energy with Bloomberg News. Uh, Lynn, there have been three coal bankruptcies in the last few months. Uh, companies operating in Colorado, Wyoming, Kentucky, Virginia. Uh, we know the, the story of coal decline. Is this accelerating? You know, what's, is this, is this, what's happening with coal right now? Is it the slow death continuing to get faster? I don't have a great update you for you because coal is exactly where it was a year ago or even two years ago. It's still in the decline. I think the U.S. government has estimated that more than 550 coal-fired power plants have retired since 2010 now, and I think something like four gigawatts is scheduled to retire in this year alone. So um, there's that, and it's not really due to politics or policy. It's really just market forces. Natural gas remains cheap. Uh, solar and wind are getting cheaper. Batteries are helping with that, and if it's any testament to where coal is headed, we just had this great feature like a week ago about the fact that there's a developer that has made a business out of buying old coal plants, tearing them down, and making them into waterfront experiences for hipsters, <laughs> uh, like in places like Boston. So yeah, yeah. They, they at least have a ha an afterlife. That's yeah, good. That, that's that's funny. Funny. I'm amazed. We'll replace that, and go dancing. Yeah. I'm amazed that so uh, on on energy Twitter, which we're all um, we involved are. in. Um, <laughs> That there, there's somebody who will remind us uh, every day that the uh, the British, or the, I guess it's the English grid, is not on coal. So, I mean, here's a country which the Industrial Revolution uh, basically pioneered the use of coal for any number of things, including, uh, well, like pre-power generation for industrial purposes, has been going relatively long stretches of time, a week or two, without using any coal. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not there at the United States yet, but it's not inconceivable to think that we're only, what, maybe 10 years away? But Jigger Shaw, in 2018, global coal emissions rose. They did. It's... Um it's a stubborn problem. Um, you know, I think in China, where people accuse folks of, you know, getting it wrong, their coal still peaked in 2013. So we, you know, they haven't gotten back to 2013 levels yet, but they have gone up the last two years. I, look, I think, um, you know, people have to recognize that this is really about an economics problem, right? The, U the globe works on U.S. dollars for energy. And if you're a country that doesn't have U.S. dollars and you have yuan or you have rupees and you have local resources, like it's, it, there can be an economic incentive not to use your hard currency for importing other energy sources, including wind and solar, and instead burning what you have locally, right? And I do think that that dynamic around the lack of hard currency for a lot of these developing countries really causes them to continue to burn coal. And we, as a developed, you know, sort of OECD, have to come up with solutions for that. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult for them to move away from those resources. You know, there's another, another aspect going on here, which is that um, the fossil fuels have, I guess, insinuated themselves so deeply into the economy that sometimes market forces aren't enough. So in India, for instance, um, coal generation, the, the movement of coal on the railroads basically subsidizes the railroads. So if you were to take coal completely out of the Indian economy, you'd have to figure out a new way to, to pay for the railroads, which was a huge, would be a huge problem. So there are a lot of examples like this where fossil fuels have become so integral to other aspects of life that it's difficult to take it out. And even if you have a better replacement, wind or solar, you, you have to solve for problems you didn't realize you had. Right, and Jigger Shaw, there's huge global subsidies for fossil fuels. I forget what the number, there was a report, I remember I heard it on the Energy Take Gang. Take a large number and that exceeds it probably. Yeah, <laughs> like trillions of dollars. And so, so many of these, these countries around the world uh, prop up the prices of fossil fuels to I mean, you know, keep them low, to keep, it, keep people happy, to, you know, stay in power. What's the path forward for, for India getting off coal? Well, I, look, I think India is, 
India is more on track to get off coal than other countries because their coal is so terrible, right? And so their coal is some of the lowest heat rate coal that you can get, and so they're just burning dirt, basically. Um, so they're importing coal from Mozambique, Indonesia, Australia with the Ambani, you know, like mine that will never get built, I think. Um, and so India is trying its best to figure out how to get off its own coal just because it, it's, it really doesn't make a lot of sense, whereas China has very, you know, high quality coal. I, but I, I do think that writ large, you know, people in other countries are viewing this as a huge way of, you know, expanding wealth creation for their own countries, right? These are fundamental ways that they can employ their young people, all of whom are desperately looking for jobs, right? And so you're in a place where I do think that we're making great progress, particularly in places like Brazil or India or South Africa and other places, because they see this as homegrown innovation. Most of these technologies are off of patent. And so I do think that we're on track to you know, reaching our goals in those places. Lin Duan, uh, what are some areas where there's really good news, where there's exciting either technology process or, or, or sunshine in the, in the renewable energy space that people may not know as much about? Where's some real bright news? Uh, I think batteries uh, are something that people should definitely be paying attention to. Um, the lithium ion boom is something to watch. Uh, it's completely transforming the renewable energy space and clean tech. And uh, Bloomberg NEF just came out with an energy outlook earlier this year that said that something like solar, uh, two thirds of the world, uh, in two thirds of the world, solar and wind are now the cheapest form of new power. Um, and that compares to five years ago when it was less than 1%. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that batteries have helped l unleash this. And I think that they will continue to. Um, until something new comes about and transforms it yet again. Batteries, the disruptive, happy story. Jigershaw, something exciting and new that you really think it really excited about? Well, I mean, I'm super excited about um, uh, geothermal heat pumps and air source heat pumps, right? Because I think that air conditioning, to me, is the big challenge um, as we make sure that people are comfortable through climate change around the world. Right, and I think that the technologies around geothermal air source heat pump are all, you know, decades old technology, but the newest form of them are so financially compelling that I think you're going to see a tremendous shift towards um, those forms of, you know, climate control. Right, and, and as, as it gets hotter, people are starting to, who never had air conditioning are starting to talk about getting it for the first time. Uh, Russell Gold, some optimistic bright spots you see out there. Um, offshore wind is mm -hmm. completely taking off. Um, east coast of the United States will have probably uh, three or four gigawatts, so think about that as like two medium-sized nuclear power plants uh, within the next few years. Um, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, offshore wind, and uh, possibly uh, off the Pacific coast in California as well over the next few years. I think there's going to be a bid round, what, in two or three years, so we'll sort of see how that goes. Um, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's a huge change, and um, the industry uh, has figured out how to do it. And actually, an interesting uh, number of the players getting into offshore wind are fossil fuel companies or former fossil fuel companies. They know how to operate in uh, build platforms uh, it, uh, offshore. Um, and you look at a, a, a company like um, Orsted, which used to be the Danish oil and natural gas company, completely got off fossil fuels um, and is now making uh, a very profitable business in building offshore uh, wind uh, just to add to that, one of the reasons why offshore wind is taking off is because of transmission, Yeah. Mm. right? Because you literally can just plug it into the urban center, yeah. and it's fairly easy right to build transmission coast. lines, you know, in the water off the coast. Yep. You don't have neighbors uh, complaining about their views or, yeah, yes, ran uh, ranchers saying, uh, pretty straightforward. don't go across my <laughs> land. Uh, Russell Gold, you've written some very impactful articles about Pacific Gas and Electric, the utility in Northern California, uh, and had the rare experience of a judge uh, requiring the company to respond paragraph by paragraph. Uh, so tell us what you wrote and what, uh, what the impact was. Yeah, first of all, if I could just say, having a federal judge say that, it sounds great 
unless you're the reporter who then has to wait three weeks <laughs> to see you know, what the response is, which can be a little nerve wracking. Um, so uh, my colleague, uh, Catherine Blunt and I have been writing a lot about this. The article that the judge, uh, that, that ticked off uh, the federal judge um, was, we reported some very basic facts, which was that the PG&E has a number of 100 year old transmission lines and transmission towers and the hardware which are just sitting out there in parts of Northern California that are incredibly fire prone right now in tinder boxes. And uh, PG&E has known about this. They've talked about this internally in documents we turned up and yet they have not replaced it. And, you know, maybe 20 years ago, that would have been fine. But these are parts of the country or the, which are just incredibly susceptible to, to massive wildfires right now. Climate change has come in, has dried out um, part, uh, large areas. Uh, you had the tree mortality problem of a few years ago. So you just have large forests that are just ready to burn and people living either in or very close to those forests. It's a huge problem. And um, you know, we, we've been writing about PG&E and its failure to, to adequately address this. And is it the fact also that they've been steering money that was, could have been spent on uh, clearing lines and shrubs and kind of putting it to, uh, giving it to shareholders or executives? Well, if we could figure out exactly where the billions of dollars that they're collecting exactly are going, um, and we've tried, we are trying, um, uh, I could give you a, 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 a very concise answer, but uh, it's, there's a lot of money going into PG&E right now, and sometimes figuring out exactly what pockets it's going into and what pockets it's coming out to has been tough. So um, we're, we're, we're looking at that. Jigashaw, the stock was at about $70 before the, uh, the first uh, wine country fires in 2017, and the PG&E stock has dropped from 70 to 17. The shareholders, equity holders, and bondholders are now fighting it out. How does this play out in terms of it? from the investor perspective that you look at? Well, I mean, I, the thing that, that disturbs me the most is that in this country, when we talk about America losing the ability to do big things, um, in the 1960s and 70s, we made a deliberate decision, and before that with the utility companies, for politicians not to have to know anything about this. Right? and basically to outsource this to other people. Right? So there's an airport authority that manages the airport, there's a highway authority that manages the highways, there's an electric authority, a water authority, a sewer authority, but the people who are elected don't have to really understand this stuff. Right? There's a monopoly that, that is in, supposedly in the public interest to actually figure this out. A lot of these executives right, are largely people who run a government agency, right? I mean, the, the CEO of PG&E is not going to be heralded as like the next coming of Jack Welch or the next coming of, you know, some major CEO who would write a management book, right? These are folks who basically know how to manipulate the system with their public service commissions to be able to rate base something, right? They've got like, like Jim Rogers before he passed said he, uh, he had like, you know, 12, you know, sort of bosses, right? And these were like the, the public service commissions of sort of Indiana and North Carolina. Former CEO of Duke Energy. And so, <clears throat> and so, you know, I think that part of the challenge I feel, which is, you know, increasingly making me very emotional, is that these groups were set, a, set up to actually provide universal services to the American people. Right? And instead, they've somehow become vessels of sort of, you know, paying each other $27 million, figuring out how to push off clean energy, figuring out how to, you know, as, as Russell talks about with TVA and, you know, Bill Johnson, who's now over at PG&E. Former uh, um, CEO of TVA. Yeah. Or, you know, you're talking about just, just this, and the people who work there are extraordinary, right? I mean, the people who work there work every day as hard as they can to keep the lights on, right? Just extraordinary people, but they're taken advantage of by the senior executives of these places, right? You look at Arizona Public Service, which is publicly shaming somebody who is standing up and saying you shouldn't um, you know, shut off someone's power when it's 110 degrees outside and someone died, right? I mean, on Twitter, they basically went after her 
to the point where she had to like sort of hide from Arizona Public Service, right? Like it's, it is getting out of control. And I do think that there is a responsibility for politicians to insert themselves back into this process and say, if these companies cannot actually operate in the public good, they either have to be broken up into pieces that can work in the public good, or they should be re, you know, like, turned into public authorities, like Bill de Blasio talked about, you know, Con Ed recently in New York, right? It, it, it has gotten to that point, and I think that, you know, for those of us who've been following this a long time, we thought that that was just a fanciful idea for a long time, and it's no longer fanciful. I think it's right around the corner for many people around the country. Then Lin, uh, Lin Duan, there's uh, something called community choice aggregation, where a lot of uh, jurisdictions, municipalities are forming their own power companies, right. getting into the power business, uh, taking power away from the investor-owned utilities. That's spreading nationally. Um, is, could that accelerate as a result of the PG&E uh, debacle? Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of CCAs are seeing this as an opportunity. And I think that your original question spoke to how are investors feeling about PG&E and utilities as a whole after what happened with pg and e and the wildfires. And I think that's an interesting question that we were actually just talking about earlier today, because if you guys hadn't noticed, it was not a very good day for the stock market. And uh, <laughs> usually, you turn to uh, companies like utilities as the safe haven that you can flee to when there's so much volatility in other parts. And we look at the stock market today and the utilities, they're just down with the rest of them. And I think that it, it, it speaks in part to a wake-up call that investors have um, uh, have gone through after the PG and experience and even before it. Um, Wall Street is realizing that the utilities f do face headwinds, that they're not completely bulletproof, that they can't be protected at all costs, that they can go bankrupt, that they are exposed to extreme weather brought on by climate change, community choice aggregators, distributed generation and rooftop solar competing against them. Um, you know, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, um, uh, other cities are looking at other ways in which to structure their utility and ways in which to open up the market to other people. So to answer your question on, you know, are there headwinds facing this industry and are investors aware of it? I think that they, they are becoming more and more aware of that. And climate's, a, climate's a huge part of that, right? Yeah. I mean, in PG&E's case, uh, you had wildfires that were climate related, which brought it to bankruptcy. Uh, you have in France and Germany uh, nuclear power plants having to shut down because of w access to water. Um, same thing we we're seeing in um, uh, coal plants in, in the Texas panhandle. And in Europe. Yeah, and you know, in Europe, so I mean, a lot, we, we used to think that these utilities were, you know, these were called, you know, these were the stocks that you bought because you were going to get this dividend each, uh, each quarter, there were going to be no problems with it, but the climate's changing, and if these companies aren't adjusting to that, um, they're not going to be the safe havens that, that we once thought they were. I think it says something that BlackRock, the arguably one of the most powerful financial institutions in the world, put out a report earlier this year. And as part of this report on climate change, they just definitively said utilities are not price pricing in the risk of climate change. And they did a very extensive uh, data heavy study to show that. There's a lot of municipal bonds issued by cities and school districts that also are not pricing in climate risk. We're talking about climate change and clean energy with Lynn Duan, energy editor with Bloomberg News, Jigger Shaw, energy investor and podcast host, and Russell Gold, reporter with the Wall Street Journal and author of the new book, Superpower, One Man's Quest to Transform American Energy. I'm Greg Dalton. We're going to go to your audience questions and invite you to go to the microphone over there for the few minutes that we have left. You can briefly identify yourself, and Sarah Catherine will uh, guide the line up there. So we got a few minutes left. Um, don't be shy. This is your chance to, um, to fire a question at our, at our guests about any of the topics we've been talking about. And if uh, there we go. There's our leaders. Well, well thank you. Uh, Russell brought up a very interesting point that in addressing the barrier for having a transmission line, you also have to address division between people. And that issue comes up often. Can capitalism actually address this? Why are we afraid of socialist planning? I say this as a personal experience. I joined California Public Utilities Commission in 1978. 
And in, 19, in 1988, I was talking about this fragmentous fragmentation of energy in the California is not really the answer. We need to have a central planning. And the answer to me was, Steve, central planning belongs to Soviet Union. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Can capitalism solve this problem, or is it part of the problem? Capitalism, I think, has to be part of the answer here. Because, you know, you mentioned before the Canadian pension funds. There is a ton of money that wants to invest in renewable energy. And if we're going to make the kind of investments, make the kind of changes that are going to be required, we have to tap that capitalism. We have to use capitalism. But remember what I said before, Texas did this weird socialist thing where they spread the cost out to build infrastructure. So maybe a little bit of a balance. Some capitalism on one hand, but some uh, socialism on the other. Well, there's many, it, many flavors of capitalism, Jigger. Well, it's really about the socialism aspect of it, which I don't think is socialist at all. It's really just planning. Um, you know, <laughs> I think that... Uh, so we just... Um, well, like, for instance, you know, the U.S. federal highway system prevents the use of any of the right-of-ways on the federal highway system for any commercial endeavor, which is why you don't have any sort of McDonald's or whatever off the federal highways, only off of, like, state highways, right? And, you know, the federal highway system already has the right-of-ways. There is a law change that could be made that just builds transmission lines across every federal highway system across the country, and they have so much land on both sides that it wouldn't be a problem, and it only costs, you know, about 40% more to bury it under the ground so you could bury it in the ground instead of having it up top. And, and you know, so we could actually just get this thing solved. But it, it's something that even the Obama administration, one of the things that I like to point out is that, you know, during Mike Skelly's adventures, right, he, Obama was in office the entire time. And he had the power of the 2005-2007 Energy Policy Acts to actually eminent domain all these power lines and didn't choose to use them because he didn't, you know, want to ruffle feathers. And it's so it's, it's one of those things where it, this is why the Green New Deal concept, whether it's formed or not, matters because government does have to lead in these planning exercises. We could put some uh, high-speed rail along those uh, roads as well <laughs> while, we're, while we're doing those lines. Next question, yeah, welcome. <laughs> um, thanks, panel. Um, this is a lot like the previous question. Um, and so where do we now um, find a legal construct um, understanding that climate change is a threat to our existence and our safety? So constructing a body that has standing that can say, you must do this or we're threatened. Can we, can we, if capitalism isn't gonna save us, can the courts save us? And by the way, I'm a woman who's looking for a job in energy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the legal construct only has to relate to courts though. I mean, Jigger and I were just talking about this California agency that's being established as part of legislators um, uh, approval of a bill, gosh, was it just earlier this year? It feels like this year has been forever <laughs> because of pg &E. But um, But they, they, they passed this bill and this agency would be responsible for being essentially a backstop to California's renewable energy goals. So if utilities or community choice aggregators or anybody else who's responsible for supplying power in California fall short of those goals, this agency would be able to pick up where they left off and ensure that California still buys a certain amount of renewable energy to meet that. So, I mean, I think that that's one example of what you're asking about, this uh, means of, of legal uh, recourse if we're not headed toward the direction that California wants us to be headed toward. Yeah, I do think that there is some acknowledgement needed that the U.S. is not a top-down system. The U.S. is more like the EU, right? So, so to say that the U.S. needs to lead, right, is like saying that the EU is leading and the EU is not leading. Poland is nowhere on climate change. And so it's really about, you know, Germany versus California or this versus that. And even there, it's really about, you know, mayors and towns, right? We can't even have unified building codes or unified uh, permit, you know, regions here in California. So I, you know, so I think it's important to notice that people really need to lead locally. Um, and I do think the legal piece is really around 
state, local policy. Um, you know, like for instance, you know, where I live in Bethesda, Maryland, in Montgomery County, um, they have one thoroughfare that carries all the traffic basically to um, DC. And there's been a lot of talk about just banning personal car ownership on that, on that thoroughfare, right? Because you now have the ability to use Lyft Line and Uber Pool and Via and this thing and that thing. And, and we already have that. Like, so in the 1990s, we called them slug lines, right? Where people just would park at this parking lot and they would just wave somebody down and they were going down Rockville Pike. And so it's not like this is a foreign concept to people, but organizing the marketplace through city councils or county councils, et cetera, is important, I think. Next question. Welcome to Climate One. Thanks. It sounds like there's a lot of available renewable energy. And from our conversation today, it even sounds like sometimes there's more than enough <clears throat> renewable energy. And yet in my home state of Virginia, they're currently building two new intrastate uh, pipelines through forests and backyards to transport natural gas. So my, qu my question to you all is, is this natural gas pipeline infrastructure necessary today? Russell Gold, you wrote the book on fracking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, Settle before I get to us, that, Russell. Yeah. literally. <laughs> um, so Virginia is a sort of perfect example. Yeah, there's tons of inexpensive renewable uh, energy available elsewhere in the country. Not necessarily in Virginia. So how do you get it there? If you can't build the transmission lines, you know, it's going to be stuck in Kansas. Um, you asked the question, uh, are pipelines necessary? Uh, you know, there is an enormous natural gas field just north of Virginia, uh, called the Marcellus, and they are trying to develop it. It's not particularly profitable right now. Um, there's so much gas, uh, honestly, at certain places that they can't get it out. So they're having, the gas operators are having a similar problem that the renewable operators are. Lots of cheap gas in Pennsylvania, how do you get it out? How do you get it to other people who want it? Um, and uh, so is it necessary? From a climate perspective, no, not absolutely. Uh, you can replace it with a lot of other uh, sources of uh, energy right now. Offshore, uh, wind would be one example, and uh, solar from the southeast could, could replace it pretty easily. Next question, welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Nora. Thanks, thanks for a shout out to Energy Twitter. Um, <laughs> and uh, It's one of the few good places of Twitter these yeah, days. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Most of the time, when we're Most not arguing about some nuclear versus all, all nuclear versus all renewables. <laughs> uh, so question to all of you, especially with regards to PG&E. So if, if, there hadn't, if there had been a municipal utility controlling the wildfire areas, how would things have evolved differently? Um, one, and then going forward, uh, what do you think the structure will or should be of the utilities in California? So. Who'd like to tackle that if? Jigger. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I don't think we can actually answer your question by saying, yes, the municipal utility would have been safer. I think we can say that SDG&E has installed safety mechanisms on all of their transmission lines such that at the point of sort of a breaking, um, it immediately, you know, de-energizes, right? And so there's no wildfire created on the, the floor. And, you know, there's like sinker phasers and others. And so it's not like those same people didn't go to pg &E and say, hey, we could help you too, and you should install these things, right? And so it was really just a failure of leadership to sort of say, if they knew all of these risks were there, as Russell and Catherine have written about, um, then why wouldn't you just install these safety mechanisms, which really cost almost nothing compared to the tens of billions and, more importantly, hundreds of lives that have been lost um, to these wildfires? And so, um, and that also is true with, for instance, in my hometown in uh, D.C., in Pepco's territory, they had put in very advanced sensors in Chattanooga, Tennessee, around how you, you know, re, uh, you know, like restart electricity in places that have these weather events. And Pepco was still doing it by telephone, right? This is in 2010, 2011. And so it took them four days longer to bring everyone back up 
because they didn't actually have real-time data, because they didn't know exactly what was happening, because they their, many of their distribution feeders were analog and not be able to communicate to a central point. And so these are things that I think if you're really prosumer and the consumer is at the center of your, you know, sort of, you know, reason for being, you would have put in 20 years ago. Next question. Welcome. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. I, I want to ask the panel what you thought of the uh, evolution of data in the utility space. So right now, uh, the network model of the grid, the kind of the core sort of connected model that determines the value and the ability to interconnect is sort of fully proprietarily, you know, possessed by the utility. You cannot access it. And there's, um, you know, legitimate security and reliability reasons, but it seems untenable long term to have uh, so much um, market innovation kind of pointed at a space where, mm. you know, the market cannot access the fundamental model of the grid. So, you know, in kind of in the long term, what does the panel see as the evolution? Will we get, you know, a, a public model the way you can get a public Google Maps model of, you know, going to Santa Cruz, you know? There was a day when Google and Microsoft tried to get their hands on that sort of thing, and the right. utilities hung on to it and said, we don't know what to do with it, but we're not giving it to you. Who'd like to answer that? <laughs> well, I, I think that's going to continue to be a big challenge, and I think that that's one that's going to have to be tackled if we're going to see things like virtual power plants and aggregation on the demand side be able to really penetrate any kind of wholesale market in a meaningful way. Uh, there has to be a lot of data that connects, and you're right, a lot of it's proprietary. And whether that gets negotiated, whether states step in or the federal government to allow access to that kind of stuff is going to be really key if any of that takes off. Well, here in the Bay Area, right, Tom Siebel put over $100 million of his own money into C2. And, you know, Exelon put money in as well, refused to deploy, of course, any of the solutions. And so, um, you know, the head of Exelon's CTO basically went to another big data firm because couldn't stand the fact that Exelon wouldn't deploy it. And, um, you know, I think Tom has now basically shifted the whole company to help the oil and gas industry and others with the big data tools because he's like, I put a hundred and some million dollars into this. Like, you know, nobody <laughs> wants to buy the, the tools, right? So... Last question. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Graham Richard, and my question is about what can we do to encourage in opportunity zones federally designated inducements for what could be $300 billion of private investment? Will it refinance payday lenders and produce more carbon pollution? There are 30 opportunity zones, for example, in Oakland alone. What do you think can be done to encourage that to be a clean energy clean economy investment. Sounds like the author of Climate Wealth. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as someone who, you know, we're investing a lot of money into solutions right now, we're steering clear mostly of opportunity zones, mostly just because the money is such a pain in the butt to put to work. It's mostly really good for real estate investors. It's not that great for clean energy. I would say over half of our investments are in opportunity zones. We're just not using opportunity zone money um, to do it because there's just good economics in opportunity zones to help do energy efficiency or anaerobic digesters. One of our big facilities in Arkansas is in an opportunity zone. So so I, I, in general, I mean, this is a longer topic, but I find the federal government's programs whether it was Bill Clinton stuff to, you know, what was it called? Like to go into these sort of rural communities or, you know, impoverished communities or the opportunity zones is just a way to give money away to rich people who want to save on taxes. Mm -hmm. I'd like to invite you to a reception outside after we close out where Russell will be signing books. Uh, not many energy books have characters as, as compelling as Skelly, so I encourage you to check it out. I'd also like you to uh, join our, our campaign, Let's Talk Climate. Take a photo of this and share it on your social media just to get people talking about climate change, whatever, um, do that. And I'd like to thank the Climate One crew. I have the pleasure of sitting up here with these illustrious and illuminating uh, leaders, and they make it happen. So Andrew, Adam, Billy, Doug, Justin, Kelly, Lena, Sarah, Sarah Catherine, Spencer, Stephen, Tyler. Let's give them a round for making today possible. <laughs> and doing this program.
We've been talking about improving the electricity that powers our mo modern lives. Renewable power is beating fossil fuels on price, but wind and solar have become partisan, and in some places, clean energy faces formidable foes. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guest today were Russell Gold, reporter with the Wall Street Journal in Austin, Texas, and author of the new book, Superpower, One Man's Quest to Transform American Energy, and Jigger Shaw, co-founder of Generate Capital and co-host of the Energy Gang podcast. Lynn Duan, team leader for Power and Gas Americas at Bloomberg News. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you podcast. Please help us get more people talking about climate disruption by giving us a rating or review. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. having us. Thanks. 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 Thank you.